Nobody will know this is take two because we weren't, we were live streaming, but silently, right? Yeah. So. Okay, this is take two. Here we go. Uh, we have the microphones on, ready to go. Um, all right, where was I? So this is, we're reading through Pilgrim's Progress, and this is the, I think, second installment of that. What I wanted to start today, though, with, you've had, especially if you watch that short video by uh, Derek Thomas, you've had some um, introduction to the life of John Bunyan. But um, because knowing about the life of John Bunyan helps you significantly to understand Pilgrim's Progress, then I wanted to, make, to give you a little bit more info on his life. And so I've got this book, Meet the Puritans. Here it is for the people online. You can see it. It's, uh, I think, who is it? Beakey? Uh, Joel Beakey and Randall Peterson. It's a, it says it's a guide to modern reprints. I'm not sure what, the, oh, with a guide. Anyway, it, it's just a bunch of short biographies of uh, the Puritans. And so, lo and behold, John Bunyan's in it. John Bunyan's in in here, regarded as a Puritan. He lived from 1628 to 1688. Now, some of this will be a little bit repetitious, but I want to, uh, um, it's, Bunyan is a guy, we'll do Bunyan a favor and we'll all get to know him pretty, pretty well here. So, um, here we go. John Owen, contemporary of, uh, of Bunyan. And this isn't in your book here. And it, it, you know, some of these have a, a bio biographical intro too. So John Owen said of John Bunyan, a, a powerful preacher and the best known of all Puritan writers, that he would gladly exchange all his learning for Bunyan's power of touching men's heart. Uh, John Bunyan was born in 1628 at Elstow near Bedford to Thomas Bunyan and Margaret Bentley. Thomas Bunyan was a tinker, and he was poor, not destitute, but poor. Still, for the most part, John Bunyan was not educated well. He became rebellious, frequently indulging in cursing. He later wrote, it was my delight to be taken captive by the devil at his will, being filled with all unrighteousness, and that from a child. I had but few equals, both for cursing, swearing, lying, and blaspheming the holy name of God. Sporadic periods of convictions of sin helped restrain some of that rebellion at, at times. When Bunyan was 16 years old, and, oh, and he said, by the way, that his father was his primary instructor in cursing. So when Bunyan was 16 years old, his mother and sister died only one month apart. His father remarried a month later. Young Bunyan joined Cromwell's new model army where he continued his rebellious ways. He fought in the English Civil War and that sobered him considerably. On one occasion, his life was wonderfully spared. He says, when I was a soldier, I with others was selected uh, to go to such a place to besiege it. But when I was just ready to go, one of the company desired to go in my, in my place, to which I consented. He took my place and coming to the siege, as he stood sentinel, he was shot in the head with a musket ball and died. Bunyan was discharged from the army in 1646. His military experience was later reflected in his book, The Holy War. All right, so that's, a, that's another book that he, that he wrote. In 1648, Bunyan married a God-fearing woman. Did she know what she was getting into, right? A God-fearing woman whose name remains unknown and whose only dowry was two books. Arthur Dent's The Plain Man's Pathway to Heaven, and Lewis Bailey's book, The Practice of Godliness, or Piety. When Bunyan read those books, he was convicted of sin. 
He started attending the parish church. That would have been probably the Church of England then. He stopped swearing after being rebuked by a wicked woman herself of the town. And he tried to honor the Sabbath day after some months. And, and see, by, so what, what you're seeing there is a little bit of uh, legalist and Mr. Wor Mr. Worldly Wise Man directing Christian off the path to go to Mount Sinai, right? And, and uh, so he did that for, for a time, shaped himself up, you know. After some months, Bunyan uh, came into contact with some women whose joyous conversation, which he overheard, uh, about the new birth and Christ deeply impressed him. He mourned his joyless existence as he realized that he was lost and outside of Christ. He wrote, I cannot now express with what longings and breakings in my soul I cried to Christ to call, to, to call me to himself. He felt that he had the worst heart in all of England, and he confessed to be jealous of animals because they didn't have a soul to give account before God. In 1651, the women, so the same women that he overheard, introduced Bunyan to a man named John Gifford. He was their pastor in Bedford. And God used Gifford to lead Bunyan, and I, I would suspect that Gifford pastored a nonconformist church, in other words, a not Church of England. It probably would have been the norm to go to the Church of England in those days, today too, and never hear that you must be born again. Never hear it, right? So uh, God used Gifford to lead Bunyan to repentance and faith. Bunyan was particularly influenced by a sermon that Gifford preached on, and lo and behold, of all books in the Bible, Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 1, quote, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. And as, as well, he read uh, Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians, in which he found his own experience as, as uh, Luther, you know, the monk trying to make himself righteous and so forth. And, uh, and Bunyan recognized his own experience in that. He said, uh, my own experience was largely and profoundly handled as if Luther's book had been written out of my own heart. While walking through a field one day, Christ's righteousness was revealed to Bunyan's soul and gained the victory. And he, because he went up and down, up and down, he would have some kind of assurance that he was saved, and then the next he would be down in the pits again. And he feared for a long time, I think I mentioned before, that he um, was guilty like Esau, and he had that he might be reprobate, and uh, so that Christ couldn't forgive him. So, so while walking through a field one day, Christ's righteousness was re revealed to Bunyan's soul, and he gained the victory. Bunyan writes of that unforgettable experience. Um, one day, as I was passing in the field, this sentence fell upon my mind. Your righteousness is in heaven. And I thought in those words, I saw with the eyes of my soul, Jesus Christ at God's right hand. There I say as my righteousness, so that wherever I was, or whatever I was a-doing, his old, old English, a-doing, God could not say of me, he needs my righteousness, because my righteousness was, was with God in Christ. I also saw, moreover, that it was not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor was it yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself. And now did the chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my afflictions and irons. My temptations also fled away. I went home rejoicing for the grace and love of God. I lived for some time very sweetly at peace with God 
through Christ. I thought of nothing but Christ. He was before my eyes. I saw now not only looking upon this and other benefits of Christ, as of his blood, his burial, his resurrection, but I considered him as the entire Christ. And it was glorious to me to see his exaltation and the worth and prevalency of all his benefits. And that because now I could look from myself to him and would reckon that all those graces of God that were green in me, new in him, were yet but like those cracked groats. I should know what that, I've heard that one before. It's what? A grain, okay. And four pence, half pennies that rich men carry in their purses when their gold is in their trunk at home. I saw that my gold was in my trunk at home, and it was Christ. The year 1654 was a momentous one. And by the way, all of those quotes, his biography is grace abounding to the chief of sinners that he wrote. The year 1654 was a momentous one for Bunyan. He moved to Bedford with his wife and four children, all under the age of six. And his firstborn, Mary, was blind from birth. That same year, he became a member of Gifford's church and he was soon appointed deacon. His testimony became the talk of the town. Several people were led to conversion in response to it, but by the end of the year, he had lost his beloved pastor Gifford to death. 1655, Bunyan began preaching to various congregations in Bedford. So when you're, when you're reading, be it Pilgrim's Progress or anything, a sermon that that Bunyan is writing, uh, reading about him, starting to preach and so forth, you got to keep in mind, this was an uned essentially an uneducated man. As far as he had no theological training and, and large crowds, people responded. I mean, it was the spirit of God and the established church hated him for it. That's why he's going to do 12 years in, in prison. So, um, 1655, he began preaching to various congregations in Bedford. Hundreds came to hear him. He published his first book the following year called Some Gospel Truths Opened, written to protect believers from being misled by the Quaker and Ranter teachings about Christ's person and work. Two years later, Bunyan published a few Sighs from hell. Remember, that's uh, Luke 16, 19, the rich man and Lazarus. And that's a great sermon, a few sighs from hell. I think I quoted from that when we went through our series on that. The book attacks professional clergy and the wealthy who promote fleshliness. It was well received and helped establish Bunyan as a reputable Puritan writer. About that same time, his wife passed away. And again, we don't know her name. No one knows her name. 1659, Bunyan published The Doctrine of Law and Grace Unfolded, which expounds his view of covenant theology. Doesn't that blow you away? I mean, he was a tinker, right? Uh, and stressing the promissory nature of the covenant of grace and the dichotomy between law and grace. And this helped establish him as a thoroughgoing Calvinist. In 1660, while preaching in a farmhouse at Lower Samsell, Bunyan was arrested on the charge of preaching without official rights from the king. When told that he would be freed if he no longer preached, he replied, if I am freed today, I will preach tomorrow. He was thrown into prison where he wrote prolifically and made shoelaces, he braided them, to provide some income for 12 and a half years. Prior to his arrest, Bunyan had remarried, this time to a godly young woman named Elizabeth. She pleaded repeatedly for his release, but judges such as Sir Matthew Hale and Thomas Twiston rejected her plea. So Bunyan remained in prison with no formal charge 
and no legal sentence. We're getting pretty close to that kind of stuff today. Uh, in defiance of the habeas corpus provisions of the Magna Carta, because he refused to give up preaching the gospel and denounced the Church of England as false. And he wrote a relation of my imprisonment, in which you can read about that. Um, well, I'll stop right there for now. I'll, I'll pick up there and read a little bit more for you next time so we learn some more about him and what those prison years were like and, and so forth. But we'll go ahead and pick up again with uh, Pilgrim's Progress. And we had left off, uh, I guess the page number probably won't do you much good, but uh, since we have different editions, but um, he was about to be instructed by evangelists. And uh, you remember that he had gotten out of the way uh, through, as, as we said, he'd come across Mr. Worldly Wise Man and who directed him to essentially, bottom line, Mount Sinai. You know, if you want to be saved, you don't need to go down that narrow way where only fools go and where you have to suffer and be hated by people. All you need to do is go see Mr. Legality and where, where do you live? Was it over in the city of morality or something like that? Was it? So you just go see him. If he's not home, talk to his son, Civility, and uh, they can direct you to an, an, an easier way. And so he did. He took, foolishly took the advice, and he ends up coming to a hill which was so steep he couldn't get up it. And then there was all these thunderings and fearsome things happening, and so he, he didn't know what to do. An evangelist came along and, and rescues him then once again, and he tells him who Mr. Worldly Wise Man uh, was. Mr. Worldly Wise Man, probably for Bunyan, I, I would imagine, repre certainly represented the Church of England and, and, or Rome or, uh, or any of those things. So um, he's supposed to be staying on the way to the wicket gate and an evangelist has to help him get back on again. So I'll pick up at this paragraph um, where Evangelist is talking, it starts out, then Evangelist proceeded saying, give more earnest heed to the things that I shall tell of thee. Do you see it? You see that spot there? Okay. Uh, what's that? Middle of 25 on this big version. Okay, yeah. Um, I will now show thee who it was that deluded thee, and who it was also to whom he sent thee. The man that met you, thee, I'll insert you once in a while, but uh, King James, is one worldly wise man, and rightly is he so called, partly because he savors only the doctrine of this world. Therefore, he always goes to the town of morality, to church. So see, Mr. Worldly Wise Man, is, he's religious, right? He's a churchman, and partly because he loves that doctrine best, for it saves him best from the cross, and because he is of this carnal temperament. Therefore, he seeks to pervert my ways, evangelist ways, the gospel, though right. Now, there are three things in this man's counsel that, that you must utterly abhor. First, his turning you out of the way. Second, his laboring to render the cross odious to you. And third, his setting your feet in that way that leads to the administration of death. Uh, the law, right, from Galatians, the law is at, or maybe it's 2 Corinthians, anyway, the law is an administration of death. The law kills. It, the law is the power of sin. It only incites sin to show us our sin. 
and there's only condemnation to be found in it. So he goes on. First, you must abhor Mr. Worldly Wise Man's turning you out of the way. Yea, and, and your own consenting thereto. Now, you see, evangelist, he, he rebukes him. Later on, I don't think it's evangelist. I can't remember who it is. But after um, helpful, I think, and uh, led by Christian, Christian messes up again, um, and, uh, and they finally get back on the right track. They're rescued again. And then the, is it, I can't remember if it's an angel or whoever, but anyway, he says, okay, both of you lay down. So they lay down. And he starts to whip them. <laughs> and it's the, it's the discipline of the Lord. And uh, they actually end up thanking him, you know. And, but here it is, you know, you need to abhor yourself for listening to this guy. Because this is to reject the counsel of God for the counsel of a worldly wise man. The Lord says, strive to enter in at the straight gate, the gate to which I send you. For straight is the gate that leads to life, and few there be that find it. From this little wicked gate, and from the way thereto, has this wicked man turned you to the bringing, uh, bringing of you almost to destruction. Hate, therefore, his turning you out of the way and abhor yourself for hearkening to him. Secondly, you must abhor his laboring to render the cross odious. It was, odious is like uh, fearful, is that right? It's a pretty, maybe a stronger word than that. Uh, it's a stumbling block. It's something hateful, ugly. So he renders the cross odious to you. You are to prefer it before the treasures in Egypt. Besides, the king of glory has told you that he that will save his life now shall lose it. And he that comes after him he, he that would follow Christ, and, and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. I say therefore, I say therefore, for man to labor to persuade you that that shall be your death, without which the truth has said you cannot have eternal life. This doctrine you must abhor. So you have to abhor the teaching, any teaching that would turn you away from the cross. Thirdly, you must hate his setting of your feet in the way that leads to the ministration of death. And for this, you must consider to whom he sent you. And also, how unable that person was to deliver you from your burden. The burden of sin. He's still wearing it. He to whom you were sent for ease, being by name legality, is the son of the bondwoman. And so now Bunyan's pulling from Galatians 4 here. He's the son of the bondwoman. Remember Hagar and Ishmael and so forth, um, which now is and is in bondage with her children. And which is in a, in a mystery, this Mount Sinai, which you had feared would fall on your head. Now, if she with her children are in bondage, and now there it's talking about uh, the Israelites, the, the Jews that are, Paul was saying, you know, the earthly Jerusalem still, still in bondage under the law. If she with her children are in bondage, how can you expect by them to be made free? This legality, therefore, is not able to set you free from your burden. No man was as yet ever rid of his sin burden to him. No, nor ever is like to be. You cannot be justified by the works of the law, for by the deeds of the law 
No man living can be rid of his burden. Therefore, Mr. Worldly Wise Man is an alien. He's an alien to Christ. And Mr. Legality is a cheat. And for his son, civility, notwithstanding his simpering looks. Simpering, was that? Humble or whatever, simpering looks. He's but a hypocrite and cannot help you. Believe me, there's nothing in all this noise that you have heard of this sottish men, but a design, a plan to beguile you of your salvation by turning you from the way in which I had set you. After this, Evangelist called aloud to the heavens for confirmation of what he had said. And with that, there came words and fire out of the mountain under which poor Christian stood that made the hair of his flesh stand up. The words were thus pronounced. As, this is from Galatians 3. As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it's written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law, to do them. Now Christian looked for nothing but death and began to cry out lamentably, even cursing the time in which he met with Mr. Worldly Wise Man, still calling himself a thousand fools for hearkening to his counsel. He also was greatly ashamed to think that this gentleman's arguments flowing only from the flesh could, should have the prevalency with him as to cause him to forsake the right way. This done, he applied himself again to evangelist in words and sense as follows. Sir, what do you think? Is there hope? May I now go back and go up to the wicked gate? Shall I not be abandoned for this and sent back from thence ashamed? I'm sorry I've hearkened to this man's counsel, but may but my sins be forgiven. Then it said evangelist to him, your sin is very great. See, and by the way, you know, here's a lesson. You'll see this theme, this attitude repeated by Bunyan here. Um, he doesn't pull punches here with sin. He doesn't make light of it. Um, he, he'd already, we already heard him say to a uh, Christian, evangelist to Christian, to abhor Mr. Worldly Wise Man, but also to abhor himself for listening to him. And now here, and now it's, uh, he says to him, well, your sin in this is very great. For by it, you have committed two evils. You have forsaken the way that's good, to tread in forbidden paths, and I guess that's the second one, and yet will the man at the gate receive you, for he has good will for men, only said he, take heed that you turn not aside again, lest you perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little, Psalm 2. Then did Christian address himself to go back, and evangelist, and, and to go back, an evangelist, and he had kissed him, gave him one smile, and bin, bid him Godspeed. So he went on with haste. Neither spake he to any man by the way, nor if any asked him, would he vouchsafe them an answer. He went like one that was all the while treading on forbidden ground, and could by no means think himself safe until he was got into the way which he left to follow Mr. Worldly Wiseman's counsel. And so in the process of time, Christian got up to the gate. Now over the gate there was written, Knock, and it shall be opened to you. He knocked, therefore, more than once or twice, saying, here's a little poetry from Bunyan, May I now enter here? Will be within open to sorry me? Though I've been an undeserving rebel, then shall I not fail to sing his lasting praise on high. At last there came a grave person to the gate named Goodwill. 
and asked who was there, whence, you know, where did he come from, and what, what did he want, what would he have? And Christian said, here is a poor burdened sinner. I come from the city of destruction, but I'm going to Mount Zion that I may be delivered from the wrath to come. I would therefore, sir, since I'm informed by, that by this gate is the way there, know if you're willing to let me in. Goodwill said, I'm willing with all my heart, said he. And with that, he opened the gate. So, this is interesting now. When Christian was stepping in, the other, Goodwill, gave him a pull. He, he grabbed him and latched onto him and jerked him inside. And then said, Christian, what means that? You know, what are you doing? Goodwill told him, a little distance from this gate, there is erected a strong castle of which Beelzebub is the captain. From thence both he and them that are with him shoot arrows at those that come up to this gate, if happily they may die before they can enter in. Then said Christian, I rejoice and tremble. So when he was got in, the man of the gate asked him who directed him there. Um, so what Bunyan is saying there is that um, even as somebody hears the gospel, and again, he's recounting really his own experience, but as they hear the gospel and they believe it and they, they come to the wicked gate, right, to, to enter in in a narrow way, even at that last moment, before they're probably, I guess you'd say, before they're in Christ, the devil often launches his attacks to kill their faith right there, okay? And, uh, and you see that, in, well, we'll see an example of that a little bit later in the sermon today is the account of the rich young ruler. He came right up to the gate, the rich young ruler did but he didn't make it, right? So one of those arrows got him. Uh, Christian said, Evangelist bid, me come, Evangelist bid me come here and knock, as I did. And he said that you, sir, would tell me what I must do. So goodwill tells him, An open door is set before you, and no man can shut it. Christian, now I begin to reap the benefits of my hazards. And goodwill asked, but how is it that you came alone? And Christian, because none of my neighbors saw their danger as I saw mine. Did any of them know of your coming? Oh yes, my wife and children saw me at the first and called after me to turn again. Also some of my neighbors stood crying and calling after me to return. But I put my fingers in my ears and so came on my way. Um, had a note here. This is from uh, uh, that message by Derek, whatever. Let's see. All of this shows in, uh, he's recounting um, his family, his wife and kids, obstinate and pliable, eventually here, and all the neighbors, this is, this is Bunyan telling us about the worldly opposition to the gospel which will come up against anybody who begins to follow Christ. Okay, he emphasized that. And it can be, can be expected. You know, how many people ever told us that? I mean, I can remember when I was a kid, of course, I didn't have any real input in my, from my family either, but when I made a profession of faith and I was hearing the gospel, all that, all that I ever heard was, accept Jesus into your heart and he'll forgive you uh, your sins and you can go to heaven. And that, that's the essence of it. But nobody ever sat me down and instructed me in the fact that this thing's going to be a battle. Here's what you can expect. Here's what's going to happen. 
nobody talks talks about about that. You see. Um, all right then, where are we at here? Um, <clears throat> I always lose my place then. Where was I, Verla? Uh, I, I flipped over to my... Okay, I've turned two pages, so... All right, yeah, none of them follow you to persuade you. Did none of them follow you to persuade you to go back? Oh, yes, both obstinate and pliable. But when they saw that they could not prevail, obstinate went railing back. But pli that means bad mouthing him the whole way, calling him a fool. But pliable came with me a little way. Why did he not come through? We came both together until we came to the slough of despond, into which we both we suddenly fell. And then was my neighbor pliable, discouraged, and would not venture further. Wherefore? getting out again on that side next to his own house. See, he always was being pulled back. He stayed, even in the slough, he stayed toward the side that was next to the route back, right? Wherefore, getting out again on that side next to his own house, he told me that I should possess the brave country alone for him. So he went his way and I came on mine. He after obstinate and I to this gate. Then said Goodwill, alas, poor man, meaning pliable, um, is the celestial glory of no small esteem with him that he counts it not worth running the hazard of a few difficulties to obtain it? Truly, said Christian, I've said the truth of pliable, and if I should also say all the truth of myself, it will appear there's no betterment twixt him and myself, Tis true, he went back to his own house, but I also turned aside to go into the way of death, being persuaded thereto by the carnal arguments of one Mr. Worldly Wiseman. Oh, said Goodwill, did he light upon you? What he would he would have you a sought for ease, he would have you seek for ease at the hands of Mr. Legality. They are both of them very cheat. Did you take his counsel? Yes, as far as I dare, but I went to find out Mr. Legality until I thought that the mountain that stands by the house would have fallen on my head. Wherefore, I was forced to stop. That mountain, said Goodwill, has been the death of many. It will be the death of many more. Tis well you escaped being by it dashed in pieces. In other words, condemned by the law and end in hell. Why truly, said Christian, I do not know what had become of me there had not evangelist happily met me again as I was musing, in, <laughs> I like this, in the midst of my dumps. He was down in the dumps and he was musing. But to us God's mercy that he came to me again for else I had never come here. But now I am come, such a one as I am, more fit indeed for death by that mountain than thus to stand talking with my Lord. But, oh, what a favor is this to me that yet I am admitted entrance here. Goodwill said, we make no objections against any, notwithstanding all that they have. They have one before, one before they, that doesn't make sense, does it? We make no objections against any, any one, notwithstanding all that they have done, maybe that should be, before they come here, they in no wise are cast out. And therefore, good Christian, come a little way with me, and I will teach you about the way that you must go. Look before you. Do you see this narrow way? That is the way you must go. It was cast up by the patriarchs, prophets, Christ, and his apostles, and it is as straight as a rule can make it. This is the way you must go. But said Christians, are there no turnings nor windings by which a stranger may lose his way? 
Goodwill answered, yes, there are many ways, but down, but down upon, oh, a, a but, that's what that means. Yes, there are many ways, a but down upon this, next to this. They are crooked and wide, but thus you may distinguish the right from the wrong. The right only being straight and narrow. Then I saw in my dream that Christian asked him further if he could not help him off with his burden that was upon his back, for as yet he had not got rid thereof, nor could he by any means get it off without help. He told him, as to your burden, be content to bear it until you come to the place of deliverance, for there it will fall from your back of itself. Then Christian began to gird up his loins, which is a metaphor for getting ready to travel, getting ready for action, and to address himself to his journey. So the other told him that by that he was got some distance from the gate. When you get some distance from the gate, he would come at the house of the interpreter, at whose door he should knock, and he would show him excellent things. Then Christian took leave of his friend and he again, again bid him Godspeed. And then he went on till he came at the house of the interpreter, where he knocked over and over. The last one came to the door and asked who was there. So we'll stop right there and pick up next time. The house of the interpreter is one of the most interesting parts of, of Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, so we'll, I think Derek Thomas... Uh, has a few words about it. Oh yeah, he does. I took some notes here from that video. So, all right then, let's uh, close in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, Bunyan's work. Thank you for the work that you did through him. We thank you for raising him up. And we thank you for this book, Pilgrim's Progress, that that you and your providence uh, equipped and, and uh, motivated Bunyan to write, and it's been the benefit of many to introduce them to the gospel all these centuries. Father, we pray your blessing on us then as we go through it, that, that we might grow wise in the ways of righteousness and reject evil. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.